Good afternoon. Welcome to our presentation on preparing your practice for Medicare's new quality payment program, Quality Reporting Made Easy. And thank you all for being here. My name is Nadine Caputo, and I'm the Quality Director at the SVS PSO. This afternoon's webinar is presented by the SVS Patient Safety Organization, the Vascular Quality Initiative, and the Society for Vascular Surgery. This is part of our education series on quality improvement, and we are pleased to partner with the SVS to offer this session to all SVS and to VQI members. Your speakers for this afternoon's webinar are Jill Rathburn, who is a consultant to the SVS on quality of care and payment issues. Jill is the founder and managing partner of Galileo Consulting Group. Jill has over 25 years of healthcare policy experience, and she has been providing professional medical societies with legislative and regulatory strategies regarding Medicare payment, coding, and coverage issues. We are also very fortunate to have additional experts on this topic uh, assisting Jill this afternoon, and that is Dr. Dr. Brad Johnson and Dr. Karen Wu, uh, Wood, um, both of the uh, SVS Quality and Performance Measurement uh, Committees. Um, Betty Kerrigan, who is Vice President of Registry Operations and Business Development from M2S, our technology partner, will also finish up uh, the session. I have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, all attendees have been placed into listen-only mode. We have a large group, over 150 attendees. We are encouraging you to type in your questions at any time into the chat box uh, located in the lower right-hand portion of the screen. And we have allocated about 15 minutes at the end of the session for questions and answers. And slides and audio transcripts of this presentation will be available um, after the call. And now I will turn it over to Jill. Thank you, Nadine, and welcome everyone to our webinar. First, we're going to quickly go through our agenda for our hour today. And as Nadine said, please, please put in your questions in the question box because we truly will be able to um, answer most of them, if not all of them, during um, this session. And also, as Nadine said, we'll have 15 minutes or so at the end. So first, we're going to talk about the quality payment program. What is it? Um, how and who participates? Then we're going to talk about the elements of the merit-based incentive payment system, which is one aspect of the quality payment program that all or many SCS members and VQI participants will need to be participating in in 2017. And that leads us to participation in 2017. How you um, can do that? what CMS is going to be requiring, um, different tools that you'll need, et cetera, which will lead us to tools. Speaking of tools, that's where VQI comes in. And we're going to talk about the value of VQI, the Vascular Quality Initiative, and how you'll be able to use that to successfully participate in the quality payment program in 2017. And then, as I mentioned, we'll get your questions answered at the end of our webinar. So let's get going. The Quality Payment Program, that will be our first topic today. And let me introduce, um, as Nadine said, Dr. Brad Johnson, who's going to get us started. Brad, take it away. Okay. This is Brad, <clears throat> Brad Johnson. The first thing I want to let everybody know is that this law, which was signed into place in 2015, is totally separate from the Affordable Care, or Obamacare, whatever you want to call it. It has no relationship whatsoever. It, this law permanently repealed the Sustainable Growth Rate, or SGR, and established a new payment system for physicians for the next 10 years and beyond. And I consider it one of the biggest changes in Medicare since the creation of Medicare. Uh, Jill, you want to comment a little bit more about this? Sure. As Brad said, this law is absolutely not the same as the Affordable Care Act. And so as you're reading in popular press about the new administration coming in and Congress looking to repeal the Affordable Care Act, that will not change any of the programs that we talk about today. The reason why we want to be so clear about that is that your participation in these quality payment programs will affect your Medicare reimbursement. 
And so we don't want anyone to think that they do not have to participate in the programs that we're going to talk about today once Congress acts in regards to the Affordable Care Act. And as Jill says, as I mentioned before, it set rates, and when we, physicians, when the first law first came out, I, like many physicians, when we looked at it, we just saw this baseline Medicare payment rate, and we saw that it repealed the state of growth rate, which we all have been frustrated with for years because it was going to cut our reimbursement. And we saw that, that we were going to have these positive updates over the next 4.5 years and, and set this rate. Well, we, well, when you read further into the law, then you realize that they had changed our reimbursement uh, more toward a, they were going to add a quality component. And so, yes, uh, there there is not going to be any negative cuts, but there are going to be bonuses and penalties based upon uh, the quality of our care, and it's going to be necessary for us to participate uh, in this in order to uh, at least avoid uh, penalties, as we'll mention beyond. So next slide. So this is just a timeline that's going to occur. And the main thing I want to emphasize on this timeline is the fact that in 2017, uh, CMS is going to start collecting data, and that data based on our performance is, is going to affect our payments in 2019. Uh, as I'll mention today, uh, most of us are going to be in the, Mer the MIPS or the Merit Incentive Payment Pro Program um, since most of us do not have APMs ready. So we're going to focus today mainly on the, on the Merit Incentive Payment Plan. Uh, since the majority of us will be in that in 2017. Jill, you want to add anything to this slide? The one thing, too, to remind everyone on this slide is that the current programs, the quality program, PQRS, the value-based payment modifier, meaningfully useful electronic health record, these programs still exist today through the end of 2016 and will affect your payments in 2018. But after that, as Brad said, they get sunset or they get stopped and they become this new program, the Merit Incentive Payment System. So we do want folks to understand that if you have not been doing your PQRS activity, the meaningful use activity in 2016, it will still affect your payments in 2018. Um, and we want folks to be aware of that. So let's go on to our okay. next slide. Next slide. And uh, the, the, you hear different terms. So initially they called uh, this MACRA. Uh, program, but now they've rechanged the name to the Quality Payment Program. So you, you'll hear us go back and forth talking about macro and quality payment as the same program. Um, and basically, the program or the policy is to reform Medicare Part B payments for over 600,000 physicians. The good thing I want to tell you about this is that for vascular surgeons or anybody, for anybody participating in VQI, uh, we're ahead of the ball game. Uh, vascular surgeons, as you know, we already knew the importance of quality, so we established the Vascular Quality Initiative in 2009, and the VQI was one of the first qualified clinical data registries uh, certified, uh, which would be certified by Medicare. And I think this is really important that everybody understands because of our establishment of VQI and our early participation, it's going to make our participation in the Quality Payment Program a lot easier. Uh, than other uh, specialties. Jill, you want to add anything to this, especially about what a QCDR is? So yes, as, as Brad mentioned, um, VQI is a qualified clinical data registry, and as you're going to see through these slides, participation in a qualified clinical data registry really makes your quality reporting and some other aspects of the new Merit Incentive Payment System uh, much simpler for um, clinicians in the country, and particularly if you're in a <coughs> private practice, or in a smaller practice, um, this could be a really good way for you to participate and avoid the penalty. Okay, next slide. So the, the good thing, SVS, especially our Political Action Committee and Pam Phillips, they really pushed to make some changes. So the, the, the law came out and then Medicare asked for questions or things that we thought were, were could be better. So we're, as uh, Jill and I go through today, we're going to mention some of the changes that that Pam Phillips did with our political action committee and other societies in, in making uh, this new law or the program a little more reasonable. And one of those things was uh, they initially had uh, Medicare Part B clinicians that billed less than 30,000. Uh, I think it was down at 10,000 actually participating. We had that raised to you're included in the program only if you bill 
more than 30000 a year, you're pro providing care for uh, more than 100 Medicare patients. The other thing people don't understand, is especially when they're ca calculating up the cost, that this not only includes physicians, but this also includes physicians' assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, and your nurse, nurse anesthetists. So if you've got a big practice and all these people are underneath your practice, uh, you have to add these into to what you're collecting on Medicare and what uh, what percentage of your collections or, or what what total of your collections are at risk either for a bonus or for a penalty. So it's uh, good to understand this. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Oh, wait a minute. Go, go back. I'm sorry. So why should I care? Uh, go back to that one, yeah. Um, the reason you should care is that the bottom line is the MIPS payment plan, which most of us are going to be participating in, I'd say 90, 95 percent of us are going to be participating in, is based upon your performance measures uh, and you need to collect data. It's going to determine what your physician reimbursement is starting in 2019. So again, in 2017, Medicare is going to collect the data on your performance in 2017, and starting in 2019, uh, it's going to to start to affect your payments. So VQI, since we've established VQI and it's a, it's a, it's a qualified clinical data registry, it's going to really help us to show or for you to show that your performance improvement. It's also going to provide comparative reports for you, and it's also going, they're going to give you the information so you can tell Medicare exactly what quality activity requirements you have done, such as going to regional meetings or participating in quality projects, so you meet uh, those things that the TMS is requiring in the quality program. Next slide. So the merit-based incentive pay payment system, what is it? Well, the components are quality, which initially is going to be 60%, as you can see, it's going to go down to 30%. Improvement activities, which are clinical activities that you do to, to improve all overall patient care. Uh, VQI, we've done such, such stuff as look as with the type of prep we're using in the operating room, determine that one prep was better than another to reduce infections. And those were the kind of activities that uh, CMS is looking for. And then advancing care information is just your mean, meaningful, uh, is your electronic medical record. Uh, and so those are going to be the first three components in the, in the 2017. They are not going to apply costs in 2017, and, and that will, will occur in 2018. Jill, you want to add anything particular to this slide? Sure. So as Brad mentioned, there's, these different um, components are going to be scored in different amounts. And in 2017, you'll see the little chart below, quality is the big um, elephant in the room. And that's going to be worth 60% of your score. So if you have not been participating in PQRS, which unfortunately about 49% of physicians in this country have not been participating, you know, even though the program has been around for, since 20, 2008, um, that's going to cause you to get the penalty most likely. And then 15% um, is going to uh, clinical improvement activities in 17 reporting and 25% to um, advancing care information. But as you'll see, over time, cost becomes a much bigger element of your score. Quality goes down, cost and quality become equal, which is more like the value-based payment modifier is today. Clinical improvement and meaningful use stay the same. So once you get your clinical improvement activities um, into place, which is um, we're going to talk about in a couple of slides here, you can really um, feel confident that you can earn that 15% needed for that um, piece of your score. And also, if you work through meaningful use, you can um, feel confident you can get that part of the score. So it's really important to understand what um, different elements are worth and how over time you can really lock in the capacity into your practice or make sure that your academic center has the capacity so that you are successful on all the components and get all the points so you get the biggest um, payment adjustment. Okay, next slide. So the next slide, we're talking about how to report. Who is your eligible clinician identifier? So you're going to have to elect uh, uh, the same uh, identifier in all categories. So for for individuals, it depends on how you want to report. So for our academic group uh, with the University of South Florida, 
we have made the decision in the first year just to report as a group. So we're going to report under our TIN number for the practice plan. Uh, whereas other people uh, in certain groups are going to uh, going to report as under each individual physician, uh, and so that that's where you, you're going to have to engage. Uh, if you're in a big, large faculty practice plan, you're going to have to engage your faculty plan to decide what they're going to do. People in private practice or in uh, groups of like four or five vascular surgeons, they're probably going to report as individuals, uh, or we will have to report as individuals underneath their uh, MPI number. Uh, for the first year, you know, there's going to be no virtual groups. Virtual groups is, uh, that was like, say, if you had some rural physicians and one physician in another, one town and, and one another. For the first year until 2018, there are, no, are not going to be any uh, virtual groups uh, in the beginning. Uh, next slide. So the proposed timeline, as we've mentioned before, is they're going to take data from January 1st to December 31st and, and record your performance for the year. You're going to submit that data March 31st of 2018. They're going to give you feedback uh, over the next year. And then in 2019, uh, your, your payment adjustment, either a, a negative or a positive 4%, will occur. Joe, you want to mention a little more, bit more about feedback to the group, or what right. feedback so is? Feed, right. So feedback is really an important time, and and again, um, as CMS unfortunately sometimes does, it's it's not easy to get these feedback reports, but it's really necessary. So this is the time frame where CMS offers physicians, eligible clinicians under MIPS, the opportunity to check their data that was submitted on their behalf or by them. So this is where CMS loads different reports about you and your group, if you're reporting as a group. Um, and this report, one of the main ones, has been called a QRUR report, Quality Resource Use Report. And these reports you can get by getting a passcode from CMS through um, the PACO system. And then you can pull your report down, check the data that was submitted, CMS allows 60 days for this process, and you can challenge the data if it's incorrect. This is important because, as Brad said, if somebody submitted data for you and they didn't do it correctly, or you submitted data yourself and you did it incorrectly, you want to get that fixed so that your payment adjustment is um, correct. You don't want to be negatively penalized for data that was not correct, and that's what this feedback time is about. Um, this is mandated by the, the law by the macro law that Brad mentioned, uh, Congress passed and the President signed. And so we as clinicians need to take advantage of this process and make sure that the data that's going in is correct. The other thing I want to make sure people understand is that the performance year, once that performance period is over, so once we hit December tw 2017, you cannot fix your situation. There is no additional time to submit data. They, CMS gives a lag time of three months so that cases that were performed in December can get submitted into the registry or into your um, process for submitting data. But there will, once 17 is over, there will be no opportunity in 18 to, quote, fix the problem. So even if you are changing your practice or you're moving practices or you're retiring, et cetera, your practice for the, or yourself as a clinician, particularly if you're moving practices, you need to be um, ensuring that data is um, submitted for you in 17. Otherwise, let's say you're in a practice in 17, but you make a change in 18, your 18 activity will be affecting your 2020 payment. Your 17 activity affects your 19 payment. So you need to make sure that what you're doing in 17 is up to snuff so that you don't get an unexpected penalty in 19 because you're uh, making a change um, in your practice situation. All right. And the next slide, it talks about reporting submission options. And this slide, I want to emphasize the fact that, that VQI is a qualified clinical data registry. And that, uh, by participating in VQI, you don't have to worry about reporting quality of care. So they can do that for you. So that, that takes away the headache or the stress about that. The other thing is, even though VQI uh, can't report your your advancing care information or your clinical improvement activities to directly to Medicare, they can provide you with 
the data so you can go into the CMS portal. The CMS is going to create, will create a portal to do your attestations for advancing peer information and clinical improvement activities. So just by participating in the Master Quality Initiative in the clinical data or, uh, database, you're going to meet, number one, the, the category for quality of care, and number of advancing care information and clinical improvement activities, they will provide you what you performed during the year, like attend, you've attended regional meetings or you pretend, participated in this quality improvement project. And so therefore, you can just take this data, go directly into the CMS portal, and report that to CMS uh, under attestations for that. Jill, do you want to add anything to this slide? Right. So this is um, basically what CMS is hoping to do over time is that qualified clinical data registries like BQI will become sort of a one-stop shop for um, clinicians to be involved in these um, quality payment programs, particularly the MIPS program. So this is a great opportunity for those of you who have not got started with EQI to dip your practice toe in the water, so to speak. The water will be warm, I promise you, and, um, and start to think about how you can get involved in a qualified clinical data registry like EQI. Because over time, that will really um, add a capacity to your practice that will allow you to be successful in the MIPS program. And also, as SVS is looking to develop alternative payment models, those models have to have quality of care, quality measurement in them, and we too will be looking to see how registry participation could fulfill that function um, in our advanced alternative payment model work that we're starting um, in January. Okay, next slide. Now uh, we're going to uh, discuss a little more of the details of the, the Merit Incentive Payment uh, system. The first thing is you need to know is that this is going to replace PQRS and the quality portion of the, the value modifier that we just paid in. And the quality category is going to compose 60% of your score and as mentioned before, it's going to decrease over time. Uh, you're going to select six out of 300 quality measures uh, for a minimum of 90 days. And uh, you're going to have outcome measures, and uh, I'll have Jill comment more about our different measures, but you're going to select a specially specific set of measures to report to uh, Medicare. Uh, Jill, you want to talk a little more about what's the difference between measures such as, you know, outcome measures, uh, when I think of that, I think of an outcome measure is like I do a carotid and do I have a stroke, what's the rate of stroke or that case. What about appropriate use measures? How, what would you describe that as? Right. So we, um, we're going to show you some of the measures in BQI here in a couple of slides. Betty's going to talk about it. But there are some measures in the system, like an appropriate use measure. Um, there's some that our friends in the American College of Radiology have done around um, radiation dose. And so you could see that as an appropriate use measure. There's some patient experience measures around some of the quality patient satisfaction surveys, the CHAP surveys. Um, as Brad mentioned, um, SVS and BQI together have developed a number of measures that CMS had deemed outcome measures because they're about the patient's outcome. Like in this instance, was the patient discharged alive after a certain elective procedure? Um, and so we'll show you those measures in a minute versus just did you or did you not do something? Um, that would be more of a process measure. Um, did you do a care plan for the patient, yes or no? Um, also, this readmissions measure, as, as some of you may be aware, your hospital um, is are under a readmissions quality program. There's four clinical areas that are impacted by that program, uh, cabbage, pneumonia, congestive heart failure, hip and knee replacement in regards to whether a patient comes back for an admission within 30 days of their initial discharge. If you're a large group, an academic group, 16 or more um, clinicians, CMS is trying to harmonize up that program and those measures, and they'll be assessing that measure on data that's submitted um, in addition to claims data. As you can see from those four conditions, there's not one that really impacts vascular surgery, so that um, measure group is probably not going to be um, as relevant to us and CMS won't be doing that um, for us. There's also some slightly um, different requirements. If you did happen to be in an alternative payment model that was not qualifying under the advanced um, APM program but did qualify under the MIPS program such as um, a level one um, accountable care organization that only has single-sided risk, then you do get some um, additional 
uh, lessening of requirements in regards to quality measures. But for, as Brad mentioned, for SDS members, we don't really have specific alternative payment models yet, so you're really going to need to pay attention to these MIPS requirements of six measures for a minimum of 90 days. Again, VQI um, can do all that for you as a qualified clinical data registry. Okay, well, Jill, I'll let you take over uh, starting with the slide okay. here. So let's. So this is the advancing care information slide. The reason Brad's giving it to me is he knows that I'm old school, and electronic health record <laughs> is as frightening to me as it is to all of you, I'm sure. Right. But um, but it is one of the requirements of the program, and it, CMS does realize that this has been a um, very challenging program for clinicians. And so for 2017, under the MIPS program, they've lessened the requirements. They are now giving more options of how to achieve this. Um, but the one thing to know um, at a minimum is your electronic health record technology must be certified under the ONC Office of the National Coordinator Certification Programs. And so that's a must-have to be able to get um, part of the 25% of their score for your MIPS score under this program. So that's sort of job one. Then there's, as I mentioned, these two opportunities for different measure sets. So if if your um, EHR is certified to the 20, 2015 standard, you're going to have two options. You can do the advancing care information objectives and measures, um, or you can do a combination of two measure sets. These types of measures are, does your EHR protect the data to the HIPAA standard? Does your EHR allow for communication through a patient portal, i.e. patient engagement? It's those types of, of measures, and you need to do um, four to five of them depending on whether you're certified to the 2015 edition or 2014 edition. If you're in the 2014 edition, you um, have a different, slightly different advancing care information transition objectives and measures, um, but you can also uh, do a combination uh, thereof. So that's sort of the EHR. Um, uh, advancing clinical information. So let's talk about the improvement activities under MIPS. This is a brand new program. It's brand new um, under the uh, MACRA law. And what it is, is as Brad said, it's really trying to move practices forward around improving clinical care. There's 90 plus activities. The activities are rated as either high or medium. If it's a high activity, it's going to be worth, quote, 20 points. And if it's a medium activity, it's going to be worth 15 points. There are nine subcategories, um, patient, uh, excuse me, practice access, which is made by measures in it like, is your practice available to your patient 24-7? Can they get to a clinician? Population management, there's some activities around diabetes control, et cetera, care coordination, beneficiary engagement, does your office have a patient portal? Um, do you uh, get information back and forth to the patient um, through that portal? patient safety and practice assessment, participation in APM, emergency preparedness and response, et cetera. But the great thing about this program is that if you are in a qualified clinical data registry, so if you are participating in VQI, either you're currently a VQI member or after this webinar you'd like to become a VQI member, being in a VQI qualified clinical data registry will enable you to meet these requirements because there's about 11 different activities all rated with 15 points. You need to do four of them, and you would get your entire score needed to get the entire 15% um, to get your uh, clinical performance improvement activity. So what would be that? One, just if you participate in VQI. One of the activities is being in a clinical data registry that's um, done by your National Medical Society. Well, there you go. Two. Do you, does your registry give you um, regular feedback reports, which BQI does, to those practices that participate? Do we um, do implementation of shared clinical decision-making capability? Do we promote the use of standard practices and tools and processes for quality improvement? Well, Brad was talking about the different research projects that BQI does and then um, gets that information back out to BQI members to be able to implement into their practice. That would be that activity. Does it um, help to do patient self-action plans? Does it help to use processes and tools that engage patients for adherence to treatment plans? All things that um, 
that um, participating in the regional meeting, um, the other local quality of DUI programs, research, et cetera, um, would meet these requirements. And as we said, M2S, BQI will give you the information that you've completed these programs. You'll go to the CMS attestation website, you'll put in the information, and you'll get your score. Easy as pie. So then, um, this is about, again, we we're talking about the MIPS composite score using BQI. So, as we mentioned, certifications is another way that BQI is supporting, like uh, maintenance of certification for MOC, part four, again, an activity in um, the CPI, in the clinical practice improvement activities, research projects at your center, um, looking at um, national and regional and local variation around quality. All those types of things are going to help you with your uh, um, clinical practice improvement score. So now that we've totally got you all going in the MIPS program, uh, CMS said, you know what? We realize this is a big change for physicians. We realize that you've been doing these quality programs, and now we're asking you to kind of start again and, and embrace some additional new programs. So CMS, and as Brad said, SBS was very involved in um, moving them toward this has decided that they're going to allow 2017 to be a transition year called go at your own pace. So what does that mean? That means that CMS is going to allow people to get started and not get penalized. So first is this thing called test pace, which basically means you submit some data after January 1 to avoid the negative 4% penalty in 2019. But let's say you are gung-ho about quality, you've been a VQI participant, or you know you can get signed up um, within the first quarter of 2017, first half of the year of 2017. You want to try to go for a small positive payment adjustment. You want to get some of that 4% um, uh, bonus money. That means you have to report for at least 90 days, and you have to report more. You have to try to get to that six measures. You will need to get the clinical practice improvement activities in and you need to try a little bit on EHR. Let's say, though, you want all of the 4% bonus money. You've been a long-time BQI member. You have a certified electronic health record. You're like, we're all in. So that's a full year participation. That would mean you would start your quality reporting on January 1. You would uh, work on know which clinical performance improvement activities under BQI you, you would be trying to qualify for and you would have your electronic health record uh, certified and, and looking at those five measures. That would, um, those are the sort of three uh, ways that we can work with physicians in 2017 to avoid the 2019 penalty, but more importantly, maybe get some bonus money. So this choosing to test, if you choose to test, all you want to do is be stable. You don't want the 4% penalty. You haven't been doing TQRS. One quality measure for 90 days or one clinical improvement activity for 90 days, or you can do five of the measures under the EHR Advancing Clinical Care Information. Well, 90 days, that's October 2nd, 2017. So you could get going in VQI, do one quality measure out of one of the modules, and be good to go. Or, more importantly, if you're in VQI, you're also doing clinical performance improvement activities, so you've got that covered too. So you're going, to, you're going to make sure you're out of the penalty just by signing up for VQI and getting started in one of the VQI modules and also signing up for them to do your MIPS reporting. Again, easy as pie. So um, we hope that no SBS member gets the 4% penalty in 2017 because there's really no reason for it. But if you're going to sign up, VQI makes it easy to get to the six measures because we're, we have... Um, SVS has been uh, developing measures, the has been developing measures, so um, we're, and Betty's going to talk about how a number of the VQI modules, just a single module, have six measures in them. So you would be at least 90 days on one of the modules. You would um, start, as I said, by October 2nd. You would get your date, which VQI would do for you if you sign up for the MIPS reporting module. And again, you'd be getting your clinical performance improvement activities as well, so you'd be well on your way to hopefully getting a little bit of bonus money. But again, if you've been doing VQI, all you need to do is sign up for the MIPS module, and you'd be able to be in full participation starting January 1st. You'd be able to look at the big money um, uh, uh, bonuses. 
So this is just a little slide that sort of summarizes things that we've been talking about for the last um, 30 plus minutes and gives you a sense again about the MIPS testing, one or one or a little bit of ACI. I'm personally, as I said, not a big technology maven. I'd be going for the one quality measure or the one clinical performance improvement activity. Get out of that negative uh, 4%. Because CMS is not kidding. If you do nothing, they are going to hit you 4%. And you won't know it's coming until you get your uh, earnings on billing statements from CMS in the, on your January patients in 2019, and there's a big negative 4% adjustment at the end of your revenue, right? We don't want that to happen to anybody. Right now, people who aren't participating um, in 2016 for PQRS automatically also get the value-based family modifier, and if you're not doing EHR, you're at risk for 9%. So we really want people to get on, get going, so that if you've been taking penalties, you'll, that will stop for you in 19. Again, if you want to get some bonus money, you've got to do partial, at least 90 days. More is better, so your six quality measures, your performance activities, et cetera. And then if you want to try to get um, everything, you do the full uh, 12 months. And Jill, let me <clears throat> briefly comment about that 4%. Mm -hmm. In my group, we've got uh, at, the, at the teaching hospital here, we have four, mainly four physicians, and we calculated that number of 4% based upon our collections in 2014. It wasn't, it wouldn't, ins it, was, it was not insignificant. It was uh, anywhere from an 80 to $100,000 penalty uh, with our collections uh, for the year. And uh, at the end, you could say that could be a $100,000 bonus for us. So it's not uh, a small amount of money. So again, I want to emphasize the fact you do want to participate at least uh, partially in this program. Go ahead, Jill. That's right. So so that's one thing you want to do in your practice is you want to, um, you know, calculate your own risk, you know, what those dollars are. Because, and as Brad said too, it's 4% of all of your Medicare money not just your surgery money, not just your E&M money, it's all your money. But let's say that you are, um, you've been doing VQI, you um, uh, have been doing the quality measures. CMS is going to have this extra money for exceptional performers. So for those folks who are doing the 12 month reporting, they're probably most likely to get into this group. CMS is gonna have an extra $500 million for each of the next five years, starting in 2019, that those physicians who are in the top group will get extra money. That extra money could be as much as instead of a 4% adjustment, a 12% adjustment, possibly even higher than that. So again, being involved in a registry really allows you to potentially be, particularly in this transition year where CMS has brought the requirements down um, to a lower amount, that you could um, potentially get some of this bonus money. And um, and it's not insignificant bonus money for the practices that got it um, under the value-based payment modifier uh, last year. Um, so again, look at your risk, look at what 4% worth, look at what even this exceptional bonus money would be worth if you got in at say 6%, 8%, 12% bonus money it might be a, a very good uh, way to get resources for your practice to pay for, like CQR participation, other quality efforts, EHRs, et cetera. So how do you get started? Well, right, Brad, if, if you're at a big academic center, you, you get to go to some meetings. <laughs> yes, the, the best way I, when uh, I started getting, getting involved in getting ready for macro uh, was first thing was I found out where in our big practice plan with the university uh, who was involved in quality, and we actually had a quality committee. Um, I met that person and got uh, nominated and put on the quality committee. This committee went on now. We've formed another committee, which is typical of the university, so we've got a get ready for macro committee. So I'm on that committee too. And then finally, because uh, once, once people, members of the committee realized how advanced uh, our master quality initiative was and our database was, they were really interested and they wanted me to talk to the CEO of our practice plan. So that was my next meeting was with the uh, CEO of the practice plan. I showed him what VQI was, showed him our database. And what. And so they've really been impressed so far with what VQI has, has accomplished. So you need to meet with the people within your, if, it's, if you're in private practice, meet with the administration in your hospital. 
Uh, if you're in, if you've got a large multi-specialty group, meet with the CEO and the leaders in that group. Tell them what uh, uh, the VQI is and what it has to offer, uh, and, and you'll find they will be impressed, and that'll help you uh, move along in, in preparing yourself for macro. Go ahead, Jill. Yes. So, um, as we said, determine how you're going to report. Find out who's going to help you if you're a big academic. Like Brad was just saying, are you going to report as individuals or as a group? Are you going to work with a third party like VQI? Um, make sure you know the deadlines. We've got a lot of dates in the slides, but really it's January 1, October 2nd, 2017 for 2019, etc. Keep up to date with SVS and VQI around the attestation options at CMS for the um, performance data in EHR. And then be positive. Think you're going to get bonus payments and make an agreement ahead of time of how you're going to split the money, right? We all want to be positive. And make yes, sure, indeed. as we said, that, yeah, go ahead, Brad. Yeah, and as I mentioned to you, the one thing with your big practice plans is decide who's going to pay the penalty and who's going to pay the bonus and where the money uh, is going to go. Uh, and that'll help people. People get serious when you start talking about distribution of, of payment and or, of uh, playing the penalty or getting the bonus, and then people will, will move along and, and they'll be more prepared for macro. Go ahead, Jill. Right. And as we said, there's going to be these feedback periods, and it's really um, important to to be involved in those. So now it's time to get ready to get set and go, and Betty Kerrigan is going to take over and talk about how to get involved and what is involved in being in VQI. Betty? Thank you so much, Jill and Brad. I appreciate that. Uh, Jill, could you advance slides for me today? You bet. Thank you. So we have an enhanced VQI QCDR program for 2017. As you heard today, there are several ways to participate in MIPS. The VQI QCDR program will offer eligible provider reporting and will submit quality measures on behalf of participants. Providers will be able to pick their pace, submitting a full year or partial year of data and up to six measures. Next slide. In 2017, the VQI, uh, VQI QCDR quality measures are currently being finalized. All but one 2016 measures will be carried over to 2017. PQRS measure 22 will be retired. In addition, we'll expand the measures for 2017 so that everyone has at least one measure to test. Nine new measures are in development five for the varicose vein measures, two for PVI, one CAS, and one lower extremity amputation measure. These measures will expand the ability for sites to meet all six measures, or as Jill says, all in. Each year, M2S must self-nominate to the CMS Quality Payment Program to be a qualified clinical data registry. Once the QCDR and measures are approved by CMS, M2S must post the measures on our website. Next, next slide. So if you want to find out what the 2016 measures are, if you go to m2s.com, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see Downloads. Press the Downloads. Jill, next slide. And then you'll see three different links. 2016 M2S QCDR measures, 2016 PQRS service, and M2S QCDR measures. Those three PDFs will give you information about what the measures are and define the measures in different ways. Next slide. One of those PDFs, um, you'll see the list of all the measures, and over mm -hmm. on the far right hand side, you'll see which registry the measure applies to. So between these three, di three different PDFs, you'll be able to understand all the 2016 ones. And as I mentioned, as soon as the measures are approved for 2017, we'll post these out on the M2S website and also on the VQI website. Next slide. So 
let's review the three components of MIPS and how they relate to the 2017 QCDR. For the quality component, M2S is here to help you submit your measures through VQI QCDR. Submit one measure for pick your pace and avoid a negative payment. Submit 90 days of data for pick your pace, earn a small positive adjustment. Or submit six measures, including one outcome measure, for a mod moderate positive adjustment. The program provides web-based feedback um, for you to understand where you are in each of the measures. Next slide. For the clinical improvement activities, the QCDR will not submit your attestation, um, but being part of VQI will help you complete your improvement activities. Many of them are listed on this slide. For example, participation in an AHRQ listed patient safety organization, or PSO, is one activity that you'll fulfill just by being part of VQI for a minimum of 90 days. Use your data to implement a formal quality improvement practice improvement program, and you fulfill a second activity. So again, others are listed on here, and I know Jill and Brad went over some of those as well. Next slide. Advancing uh, care information. VQI is a specialized registry and a QCDR. Submit your data electronically to the QCDR or specialized registry and earn 5% bonus in points in the advancing care performance category. Next slide. So what about enrolling in the 2017 QCDR? Once approved by CMS, enrollment will begin. We anticipate this to be in late uh, first quarter 2017. Pricing for the program will be established and announced at that time. Pathway support will send out an enrollment instructions. Eligible providers, physicians, will complete a provider authorization form, which will allow M2S to submit data and results to CMS for the quality payment system. Uh, next slide. If you aren't signed up for VQI and you need to sign up for VQI, email us at vqi at m2s.com. If you want to learn more about the Vascular Quality Initiative, go to vqi.org. With that, I'll turn it back over to Jill. Thank you, Betty. Now, we've had some great questions that have been submitted already that we're going to start answering right now. But please, um, if you have a question and you haven't yet, um, send it in. Please do, because if you have the question, one of our other participants may have it as well, and it's great to get everybody's questions answered. Now, we had a question early on about timeline, and we did um, sort of talk about that even if you're, you think your practice status might be changing. So let's say that you're um, retiring or you think you might be moving. Um, something's going on with your situation, but it not, it's not happening in 17, it's happening in 18. Well, you need to continue to report in 17 um, if you are reporting as a group. Your whole practice is going to need to keep reporting because then someone who's coming into your practice is going to be covered by that reporting in 19 even if you're retiring out of your practice. Let's say you're um, selling your practice. You need to make sure that the person who's buying it has been reporting somewhere else in 2017. Otherwise, that person's going to be penalized in 2019 because they didn't do anything from wherever they were coming from. So you need to know that this goes with you, so to speak. If you are a group number and an MPI and you're in a small practice, like Brad said, maybe one clinician, i.e. a physician, or two, it's probably good to report as individuals. This is, again, where VQI is the perfect solution because you can put in your data on each individual physician's cases. If you only have one physician, great. If you have a couple more, it's an easy solution and you all report as individuals. So um, I think Betty just covered the fact that at least um, for 2017 uh, reporting for 2018 payment, VQI is still only going to be reporting on folks as individuals, not for the group, right, Betty? That's 
correct. For 2017, we will do only the eligible provider and not the group. Okay. Then we have a question about venous disease and vein centers. Now, Betty, that would be, or Brad, or Karen, or Brad and Karen are both DQI participants, by the way. That's the new uh, registry uh, module that we think of as varicose vein, right? Oh, uh, yes, correct. that's correct. Okay, because we have a question about sort of the a practice, from a practice that's very dedicated to venous disease, the vein center, and to date um, that hasn't uh, been as uh, big of a module of EQI. They've been using a different product that they're not as satisfied with. So it sounds like for 2017, with the addition of these new five measures that our uh, venous, por our uh, vas varicose vein module mm -hmm. will be ready. That's correct, Jill. So a vein center um, could either pick their pace by choosing one measure um, or reporting for 90 days, or now with the additional measures, they would be able to be all in and uh, report against all the measures. Right. Very good. So for, um, we have a question about uh, patient engagement and patient interaction. So as I mentioned, all of the current quality programs, PQRS, value-based payment modifier, um, meaningful use of electronic health record, those programs are all sunsetting at the end of this calendar year, so in two weeks. So those requirements under those programs will be over. And so we have these new requirements that we discussed today around quality measure reporting, clinical practice improvement activities, and advancing care information. So you want to be sure you're up to speed on these new requirements, although the measures that were used in PTRS are almost all, with the exception of like PTRS measure 22, are being moved over into the quality program, but many of the other activities are not. CMS has a really, I'm hearken to say this, fabulous new website called www.qpp.cms.gov that is really lay-friendly, clinician-friendly, lays out all the requirements um, for the quality payment program. I encourage you to look at it um, because some of um, the requirements, like we have a question about PKRS and patient portal, patient participation, and um, under this new program, that is an option you could select under clinical practice improvement activities. But as we mentioned, there's 90 activities. At most, you'd need to be doing four. And if you're in a registry, a qualified clinical data registry, um, you would be selecting certain activities. As Betty mentioned, if you're in VQI, patient safety organization one, participation in medical society registry two, um, you, you know, you do a couple other uh, quality programs, um, research programs, et cetera, and you're in. So you can see sort of a different way to look at the types of, um, of uh, requirements. So then we have a question. If oh, so this is always a traditional question. Why isn't Medicare paying us the cost of all this quality work? That is a good question. And while there is some uh, some money in the macro law around quality improvement, um, that money has not is going to be used for um, infrastructure development like new measures, et cetera. So really, what CMS is hoping to do by pick your own pace is to ensure that more physicians get some sort of small bonus money who participate in registries such that that bonus money will then back pay for the cost of the registry and also hopefully give you money to pay for your 2018 cost of registry participation. But I will say that um, participating in the VQI, now be called MIPS module, um, is, is not um, um, too extravagant uh, cost-wise and so hopefully um, your bonus money will cover that um, sort of back pace. And then also, uh, when we started uh, Tampa General, one of the things you can do is engage uh, your hospital. They're interested in quality. Uh, uh, their payments are going to be affected by the quality of your work. So usually you can get, uh, we have been able to, to get our hospital to contribute to paying toward the the hiring and, and the necessary work required to to do our to participate in VQI and also 
to work on our quality measures. So en engage whatever hospital you're working with, or if you're in a large physician group, engage the leadership of that group. And usually they will, will at least uh, pay part of, of the cost of this quality. So one of the questions we have that I think is a really good question is, can a center switch from pick your own pace um, up to partial or full reporting during the given year? And my answer to that is yes. You don't technically sign up for a pick your own pace type. So let's say you get going, you get going earlier than October 2nd, and um, you have the opportunity to do more. The more you, basically the philosophy is, the more you do, the more probability you're getting bonus money. So at a minimum, to get out of the penalty, you have to do one or one um, for 90 days. But if, So basically your philosophy should be, I have to get to that, but the more I do, up to six measures, up to four um, CPIAs, and trying to do electronic health record, the more of that I do over 2017, the more pro my probability goes up to get bonus money. You definitely get rid of the penalty if you do at least one or one, but your more probability of bonus money goes up the more you do. So you don't, CMS will, uh, will certify what you did at the end. You personally don't pick uh, a one of the three ways. You just try to do your very best over the year and, um, and that should, and that will be how CMS determines your bonus money. We also had a good question about how do how does CMS determine the Medicare revenue? So it's Medicare, your total Medicare revenue, so what Medicare pays you, Joe, Medicare allowables. So it's what you're getting um, from Medicare. So that's probably, and I'm going to check this question for you. So please um, come to the SVS or VQI website for an absolute specific answer. But Medicare does pay the 80%. The patient has to pay the 20%, even if a Medicap plan pays the 20% for the patient. So it's going to, in my opinion, be on the 80%. So it's what the federal government Medicare program pays you, right? So that's, um, but I'm going to verify that for sure and um, come check back on the website um, and we'll get you that answer. That's a good kind of start to a nice FAQ, frequently asked questions that we could do for all of you there. Yeah. Another thing I need to add is that, you know, private insurance companies follow Medicare. So private insurance companies are interested in this type of payment system too. So yes, everybody says, well, I've only got a certain percentage of Medicare patients or part of my, you know, I don't have a large revenue from Medicare, but in preparing for this, you're also going to be preparing for the future. Because I think the future is going to be that the private insurance companies are going to follow this model too. So here's another really great question. Um, we are in the process of starting VQI for four modules in conjunction with our hospital's quality department. Does my private practice have to do anything extra to use this to report as a practice? Well, that's a good question. One, are you a hospital employed physician or are you employed by your private practice? I.e., where's your tax identification number and where's your NPI number held? i.e., who's the reporting entity? That's one thing you have to find out and make a decision on who's going to report. Second, we didn't talk about it today, but we should have. Um, there is a requirement that you need to report at least 50% of the patients that would qualify under the measure. You should just be reporting all. It's just easier that way. You don't think about it. You just report every patient, and then you're fine. But Medicare does have a report standard in regards to how much data has to come in on each measure. So again, if the hospital is going to have 50% of your patients going into those four uh, modules that you'll be billing um, for those services that are in the quality measures, then um, again, you want to um, see what's your billing entity, where's that data going to come in on your physician claim, is it going to meet 50% of your patients of doing those procedures, and thus then should you be talking to BQI about adding on the MIPS module um, for your practice for 2017. So that sounds to me like a good uh, reason to um, have a conversation with BQI um, with all the parties since you're setting these modules up now and um, you can get it all squared away um, for 2017 for everything. And again, a number of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Betty. 
just to clarify returning. one thing, uh, Jill, the, to participate in MIPS, uh, it, it would be to participate in the QCDR. So it's not necessarily a separate module. It's oh, to enroll in the VQI QCDR. So I just want to make sure that that was, was clear. Thank you, Betty. That's great. Okay. So let me look at my handy dandy watch. Um, we're right at two two o'clock. It looks like, um, and we appreciate everybody hanging with us here for the whole hour. I know it's busy, busy, busy in healthcare these days. I'm just quickly running through the questions one more time. Make sure that I haven't left anything out that folks are hoping to get answered here. And I really encourage everyone to check the. Um, M2S website, VQI website, um, SVS website for these slides and um, copies of this webinar. Also, as Betty said, there'll be more information um, once the um, QCDR application is approved by CMS around um, getting people signed up, the pricing for 2017 for the different options, et cetera. So again, encouraging people to um, get connected, get information. Um, be ready to uh, make those final decisions in um, early 2017. And just checking to make sure. I think we've got basically all of our questions answered. Oh, one question, Betty. Um, training for uh, folks that uh, uh, get into the VQI and particularly the QCDR element of it to make sure that their data is accurate going in to the um, to the Medicare program. Um, how can you give us just a little flavor of how that might work? Sure. As sites enroll in different VQI modules, um, upon enrollment in VQI, there's a training program, uh, a webinar-based training that they learn how to enter data and view data in VQI, and then to be able to look at the QCR information, it's again through that portal. So we assist in in uh, training sites on that. So we um okay, great. So thank you everyone. Um, for being with us on this uh, webinar. Again, we greatly appreciate your participation and your time. And again, please um, send your questions by email to vqi at m2s.com and um, be on the lookout for the slides and the audio and, um, and future education about the quality payment system and um, and the various elements, the Merit Incentive-Based Payment System and Advanced Alternative Payment Model in the future, um, we'll be having articles in the vascular specialists. We'll also be having articles in uh, uh, JBS, et cetera, to make sure that um, we're getting you the information about these new uh, Medicare quality programs for physicians in a in a quick and timely manner, so that everyone can be successful in 2017 and in the future years after that.